Mm -hmm. It's been like that lately, and I was just curious what you were reading. That's all. Really, what do you mean, like, like that? Plays like like signs from the play come up, and like they just like find you or something, or yeah, like, like little things you know, here and there, or things that I'm watching. They'll make a reference to it, and it's <laughs> you know, it's sometimes it just happens more than others, and that's been the thing for like the past two weeks. So I'm just, I was just curious, yeah. What? Like, like what? Okay, well, we're we're live on YouTube, so uh, thank you for joining us for the uh, Instant Shakespeare Company reading of Tartuffe by Moliere. Um, although there's even an authorship question with Moliere, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, Simon uh, Kunran, who's had Rod, his, uh, his, the playmaster. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. I hadn't checked with you before. So uh, anyways, um, uh, I'm, I, I can't join you, but I'll be listening because I'm out uh, delivering mail. So, uh, so have a really great reading. And I uh, turn it over to Simone, just a sort of reminder when you're in the scene, uh, have your video on and, and be unmuted. And when you're not in the scene, stop your video and mute yourself so that when it's on gallery view and, and Marin is host, you need to watch on gallery view, uh, that that'll just show the people who are in the scene. So uh, uh, enjoy and, uh, and have, a, uh, have a terrific reading and I'll be listening. <laughs> Okay, great. So Tartuffe, a comedy in five acts by Moliere, premiered in 1664 and later that same year was produced at uh, Versailles under the crown of Louis XIV. Um, Moliere played Oregon and his wife played Elmir. So first we'll have the cast introduce himself. We start out with Tartuffe. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Margolis and I'm playing Madame Panel. And Tartuffe? Stephen Brown playing Tartuffe. Organ? And playing Oregon? Is Angus here? Muted. I think he's having audio problems because he's not, not particularly, he's not actually muted, but he's fixing his microphone. Okay, well, we'll carry on for Oregon. Almir? One, two, three. Ah, there you are. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Angus Hepburn playing Oregon. Almir? Uh, Marin Sugarman playing Almir. Madame Pernel? Miguel Fana playing Dummy. Cleant? Uh, Derek Tarson playing Cleant. Madame Pernel? Maybe she already did. Okay, Damas. That's Damis. Damis. Actually, I think I think he already introduced himself. Okay, Valer. Alexander Chilton playing Valer. Marianne. I'm Amelia Bell. I'm playing Marianne. Monsieur Loyal and police officer. Uh, I am Ken Wayne. I'm playing those. And I'm Simone Kunrak playing Doreen. All right, so a scene in Paris. Act one, scene one. Oh, come, come feel the part and let me get away. Oh, <sighs> sorry. You hurry so, I hardly can attend you. Then don't my daughter-in-law, stay we on. I can dispense with your polite attentions. We're only paying attention, paying what is due you, mother. Why must you go away in such a hurry? Because I can't endure your carryings on. And no one takes the slightest play, pains to please me. I leave your house, I tell you, quite disgusted. You do the opposite of my instructions. You've no respect for anything. Each one must have a say. It's perfect pandemonium. If... Your servant will wench, my girl, much too full of gab and too impertinent and free with your advice on all occasions. But? Oh, you're a fool, my boy. F-O-L just spells your name. Let grandma tell you that. I've said a hundred times to my poor son, your father, that you'll never come to good. Oh, or give him anything but plague and torment. I think. Oh, dearie me, his little sister. You're all demure and his butter wouldn't melt in your mouth. One would think to look at you. Still waters, though, they say, you know the proper. 
and I don't like your doings on the slide. But mother. What about your lead, your conduct and everything is altogether wrong. You ought to set a good example for them. Their dear departed mother did much better. You're extravagant and it offends me to see you always decked out like a princess. A woman who would please her husband's eyes alone wants no such wealth of fineries. But, madam, after all... Oh, sir, is for you, the lady's brother. I esteem you highly, love and respect you, but, sir, all the same, if I were in my son's, her husband's place, I'd urgently entreat you not to come within our doors. You preach a way of living that decent people cannot tolerate. I'm rather frank with you, but that's my way. I don't mince matters. When I mean a thing, I say. Mr. Tartuffe, your friend is mighty lucky. He is a holy man and must be heeded. I can endure with any show of patience to hear a scatterbrain like you attack him. What? Shall I let a bigot criticaster come and usurp a tyrant's power here? And shall we never dare amuse ourselves to this fine gentleman deigns to consent? If we must hark to him and heed his maxims, there's not a thing we do but what's a crime. He censors everything, the zealous carper. And all he censures is well censured too. He wants to guide you on the way to heaven. My son should train you all to love him well. No, madam. Look you, nothing, not my father, nor anything can make me tolerate him. I should belie my feelings not to say so. His actions rouse my wrath at every turn, and I foresee that there must come of it an open rupture with this sneaking scoundrel. Besides, tis downright scandalous to see this unknown upstart master of the house, this vagabond who hadn't when he came shoes to his feet or clothing worth six farthings, and who so far forgets his place as now to censor everything and rule the roost. Ah, mercy sakes alive! Things would go better if all were governed by his pious orders. He passes for a saint, in your opinion. In fact, he's nothing but a hypocrite. Just listen to her tongue. I wouldn't trust him, nor his Laurence without bonds and surety. I don't know what the servant's character may be, but I can guarantee the master a holy man. You hate him and reject him because he tells home truth to all of you. It is sin alone that moves his heart to anger. And heaven's interest is his only motive. Of course. But why, especially of late, can he let nobody come near the house? Is heaven offended at a civil call that he should be made so great a fuss about it? I'll tell you, if you like, just what I think. Upon my word, he's jealous of our mistress. Oh, you hold your tongue and think what you are saying. He's not alone in censuring these visits, the turmoil that attends you sort of people, their carriages forever at the door, and all their noisy footmen flock together, annoy the neighborhood and raise a scandal. I gladly think there's nothing really wrong, but it makes talk and that's not as it should be. Huh. Madam, can you hope to keep folks' tongues from wagging? It would be a grievous thing if, for the fear of idle talk about us, we had to sacrifice our friends. No, no, even if we could bring ourselves to do it. Think you that everyone would then be silenced against backbite? A bit backbiting, there is no defense. Let us try to live in innocence. To silly, to silly tattle, pay no heed at all, and leave the gossips free to vent their gall. Our neighbor Daphne and her little husband must be the ones who slander us, I'm thinking. Those whose own conducts most ridiculous are always quickest to speak ill of others. They never to fail to seize at once upon the slightest hit of any love affair and spread the news of it with glee and give it the character they'd have the world believe in. By others' actions painted in their colors, they hope to justify their own. They think in the false hope of some resemblance either to make their own intrigue seem innocent or else to make their neighbors share the blame with they are loaded with by everybody. These arguments are nothing to the purpose. Our auntie, we all know, lives a perfect life. Her thoughts are of all of heaven, and I've heard that she condemns the company you keep. Oh, Admiral Pattern, virtuous dame, she lives with the model of austerity, but age has brought this piety upon her, and she's a prude, and now she can't help herself. 
As long as she could capture men's attentions, she made the most of her advantages. But now she sees her beauty vanishing. She wants to leave the world that's leaving her. And in the species fail of haughty virtue, she'd hide the weakness of her worn out charms. That is the way with your old coquettes. They find it hard to see their lovers leave them and thus abandon their forlorn estate, can find no occupation but a prudes. These pious dames in their austerity must carpet everything and pardon nothing. They loudly blame their neighbor's way of living, not for religious sake, but out of envy, because they can't endure to see another enjoy the pleasures age has weaned them from. Oh, there, that's the kind of rigmarole to please you, daughter-in-law. One never has a chance to get a word in edgewise at your house, because this lady holds the floor all day. But nonetheless, I mean to have my say too. I tell you that my son did nothing wiser in all his life than take this godly man into his household. Heaven sent him here in your great need to make you all repent. For your salvation, you must hearken to him. He censures nothing but deserves his censure. These visits, these assemblies, and these balls are all inventions of the evil spirits. You never hear a word of godliness at them, but idle crackle nonsense, flim flam. Our neighbor often comes in for a share. The talk flies fast and scandal fills the air. It makes a sober person's head go round at these assemblies just to hear the sound of so much gab with not a word to say. And as a learned man remarked one day most aptly, tis the Tower of Babylon where all beyond all limits babble on. And just to tell you how this point came in, <laughs> oh, so now the gentleman must snicker, must he? Go find fools like yourself to make you laugh and don't, oh, daughter, goodbye, not what a word more. As for this house, I leave the half unsaid, but I said, soon set foot in it again. Come, come, what makes you dream and stand the gape? Hussy, I'll warm your ears in proper shape. March, Trollope, march! Act one, scene two. I won't escort her down for fear she might fall foul of me again, the good old lady. Bless us. What a pity. She shouldn't hear the way you speak of her. She'd surely tell you you're too good by half and that she's not so old as all that neither. How she got angry with us all for nothing and how she seems possessed with her tartuffe. Her case is nothing, though, besides her son's. To see him, you'd say he's ten times worse. His conduct in our late unpleasantness had won him much esteem and proved his service in the service of our king. But now he's like a man besotted, since he's been so taken with this tartuffe. He calls him brother, loves him a hundred times as much as mother, son, daughter, and wife. He tells him all his secrets. He lets him guide his acts and rule his conscience. He fondles and embraces him. A sweetheart could not, I think, be loved more tenderly. At table, he must have the seat of honor, while with delight our master sees him eat as much as six men could. We must give up our choicest tidbits to him. If he belches, tis a servant speaking, master exclaims, God bless you. Oh, he dotes upon him. He's his universe, his hero. He's lost in constant admiration, quotes him on all occasions, takes his traveling acts for wonders and his words for oracles. This fellow knows his dupe and makes the most on it. He fools with him a hundred masks of virtue, gets money from him all the time by canting and takes upon himself to carp at us. Even a silly cuckscomb of a lackey makes it his business to instruct us too. He comes with rolling eyes to preach at us and throws away our ribbons, rouge, and patches. The wretch the other day tore up a kerchief that he had found pressed in the golden legend, calling it a horrid crime for us to mingle the devil's finery with holy things. Act one, scene three. Oh, you're very lucky to have missed the speech she gave to she gave us at the door. I say my husband is home again. He hasn't seen me yet. So I'll go up and wait till he comes. And I, to save time, will await him here. I merely say good morning and be gone. Act one, scene four. I wish you'd say a word to him about my sister's marriage. I suspect Tartuffe opposes it and puts my father up to all these wretched shifts. You know, besides, 
how nearly I'm concerned in it myself. If love unites my sister and Valer, I love his sister too. If this marriage were to... He's coming. <gasps> Act one, scene four, five. Ah, good morning, brother. I was just going, but glad to greet you. Uh, things are not advanced yet in the country? Doreen, uh, uh, just wait a bit, please, brother-in-law. Uh, let me allay my first anxiety by asking news about the family. Uh, has everything gone well these last two days? Uh, what's happening? Uh, and how is everybody? Madam had a fever and a splitting headache. Day before yesterday, all day and evening. And how about Tartuffe? Tartuffe? He's well. He's ah. mighty well stout, fat, fair, rosy lit. Poor man. At evening, she had nausea and couldn't touch a single thing for supper. Her headache was still so severe. And how about Tartuffe? He supped alone before her and unctuously ate up two partridges, as well as half a leg of mutton, deviled. Oh, poor man. At night, she couldn't get a wink of sleep. The fever racked her so, and we had to sit up with her till daylight. Oh, how about Tartuffe? Gently inclined to slumber, he left the table, went to his room, got himself straight into a good warm bed, and slept quite undisturbed until next morning. Oh, poor man. At last she let us all persuade her and got up courage to be bled. And then she was relieved at once. And how about Tartuffe? Plucked up courage properly, bravely entrenched his soul against all evils, and to replace the blood she had lost, he drank at breakfast four huge draughts of wine. Oh, poor man. So now they are both doing well, and I'll go straight away and inform my mistress, mistress how pleased you are at her recovery. Act one, <sighs> scene six. Brother, she ri ridicules you to your face. And I, though I don't want to make you angry, must tell you candidly that she's quite right. Was such infatuation ever heard of? And can a man today have charms to make you forget all else, relieve his poverty, give him a home, and then- Just stop there, good brother. You do not know the man you're speaking of. Since you will have it so, I do not know him. But after all, to tell you what sort of man he is. Dear brother, you'd be charmed to know him. Your raptures over him would have no end. He is a man who, uh, in fact, a man, whoever does his will knows a perfect peace and counts the whole world else as so much dung. His converse has transformed me quite. He weans my heart from every friendship, teaches me to have no love for anything on earth. And I could see my brother, children, mother, and wife all die and never care a snap. <laughs> Your feelings are humane, I must say, brother. Oh, if you'd seen him as I first saw him, you would have loved him just as much as I. He came to church each day with contrite mien, kneeled on both knees right opposite my place, and drew the eyes of all the congregation to watch the fervour of his prayers to heaven with deep-drawn sighs and great ejaculations. He humbly kissed the earth at every moment, and when I left the church he ran before me to give me holy water at the door. I learned his poverty and who he was by questioning his servant, who is like him, and gave him gifts. But in his modesty, he always wanted to return a part. It is too much, he'd say, too much by half. I am not worthy of your pity. Then when I refused to take it back, he'd go before my eyes and give it to the poor. At length, heaven bade me take him to my home. And since that day, all seems to prosper here. He censures everything, and for my sake he even takes great interest in my wife. He lets me know who ogles her, and seems six times as jealous as I am myself. Uh, you'd not believe how far his zeal can go. He calls himself a sinner just for trifles. The merest nothing is enough to shock him, and so much so, 
that the other day I heard him accuse himself for having, while at prayer, in too much anger, caught and killed a flea. Soons, brother, you are mad, I think, mm -hmm. or else you're making sport of me with such a speech. What are you driving at with all this nonsense? Brother, your language smacks of atheism, and I suspect your soul's a little tainted therewith. I've preached to you a score of times that you'll draw down some judgment on your head. That is the usual strain of all your kind. They must have everyone as blind as they. They call you an atheist if you have good eyes. And if you don't adore their vain grimaces, you've neither faith nor care for sacred things. No, no, such talk can't frighten me. I know what I'm saying. Heaven sees my heart. We're not the dupes of all your canting mummers. There are false heroes and false devotees. And as true heroes never are the ones who make much noise about the deeds of honor, just so true devotees whom we should follow are not the ones who make so much vain show. What? Will you find no difference between hypocrisy and, and genuine devoutness? And will you treat them both alike and pay the selfsame honor both to masks and faces? Set artifice beside insincerity? Confuse the semblance with reality, esteem a phantom like a living person, and counterfeit as good the, an honest coin? Men, for the most part, are strange creatures, to truly. You never find them keep the golden mean. The limits of gold sense, too narrow for them, must always be passed by in each direction. They often spoil the noblest things because they go too far and push them to extremes. I merely say this, by the way, good brother. You are the sole expounder of the doctrine. Wisdom shall die with you, no doubt, good brother. You are the only wise, the sole enlightened, the oracle, the Cato of our age. All men compared to you are downright fools. I'm not the sole expounder of the doctrine, and wisdom shall not die with me, good brother. But this I know, though it be all my knowledge, that there's a difference twixt false and true. And as I find no kind of hero more to be admired than men of true religion, nothing more noble or more beautiful than is the holy zeal of true devoutness, just so I think there's not more odious than whited script sepulchres of outward unction. Those barefaced charlatans, those hireling zealots, whose sacrilegious, treacherous pretense deceives at will and with impunity makes mockery of all that men hold <sighs> sacred. Men who, enslaved to selfish interests, make trade and merchandise of godliness and try to purchase influence and office with false eye rollings and affected raptures. Those men, I say who with uncommon zeal seek their own fortunes on the road to heaven, who skilled in prayer have always much to ask and live at court to preach retirement, who reconcile religion with their vices, are quick to anger, vengeful, faithful, faithless, tricky, and to destroy a man will have the boldness to call their private grudge the cause of heaven all the more dangerous, since in their anger they use against us weapon men revere. And since they make the world applaud their passion and seek to stab us with a sacred sword, there are too many of this canting kind. Still, the sincere are easy to distinguish, and many patterns may be found in our own time before our own eyes. L look, Aristotle, Pyrion, uh, Orant, uh, Alcim, Damas, uh, Clitandre, and Polydor. No one denies their claim to true religion. Yet they are no braggadocios of virtue. They do not make insufferable display, and their religion's human, tractable. They are not always judging of all our actions. They think such judgment savored of presumption. And leaving pride of words to other men, tis by their deeds alone they censure ours. Evil appearances find little credit with them. They even incline to think the best of others. No cabalers, no intriguers. They don't, they mind the business of their own right living. They don't attack a sinner tooth and nail, for sin's the only object of their hatred. 
nor are they overzealous to attempt far more in heaven's behalf than heaven would have them. That is my kind of man. That is true living. That is the pattern we should set ourselves. Your fellow was not fashioned on this model. You're quite sincere in boasting of his zeal, but you're deceived, I think, by false pretenses. My dear good brother-in-law, have you quite done? Yes. I am your humble servant. Just a word. We'll draw from the other subject. But you know, Belair has had the promise of your daughter. Oh, yes. You had named the happy day. It is true. Then why put off the celebration of it? Well, I can't say. Can you have some other plan in mind? Perhaps. You mean to break your word? Oh, no, I don't say that. I hope no obstacle can keep you from performing what you promised. Well, that depends. Why must you beat about? Blair has sent me here to settle matters. No, oh, heaven be praised. What answer shall I take him? Why, anything you please. But we must know your plans. What are they? I shall do the will of heaven. Come, be serious. You've given your promise to Valère. Now, will you keep it? Goodbye. His love, methinks, has much to fear. I must go let him know what's happening here. Act two, scene one. Uh, now, Marianne? Yes, father? Come, I'll tell you a secret. Yes. What are you looking for? Well, to see there's no one there to spy upon us. That little closet's mighty fit to hide in. Ah, there. Now we're all right now. Marion, in you I've always found a daughter dutiful and gentle, so I've always loved you dearly. I'm grateful for your fatherly affection. Well-spoken daughter. Now prove you deserve it by doing as I wish in all respects. To do so is the height of my ambition. Excellent. Well, uh, what say you of Tartuffe? Who? I? Yes, you. Uh, look to it how you answer. Why, uh, I'll say of him anything you please. Yeah. Act two, scene two. Well spoken. <laughs> A good girl. Uh, say then, my daughter, that all his person shines with noble merit, that he has won your heart, and you would like to have him, by my choice, become your husband, eh? Eh? What say you? Please, what did you say? What? Surely I mistook you, sir. Hannah? Who is it, father, you would have me say has won my heart? And I would like to have become my husband by your choice? Tartuffe! But father, I protest it isn't true. Why should you make me tell this dreadful lie? Because I mean to have it be the truth. Let this suffice for you. I've settled it. But father, you would... Yes, child. I am resolved to graft Tartuffe into my family. So he must be your husband. That I've settled. And since your duty... Oh... What are you doing here? Your curiosity is keen, my girl, to make you come eavesdropping on us so. Upon my word, I don't know how the rumor got started. If twas guesswork or mere chance, but I had heard already of this match and treated it as utter stuff and nonsense. What? Is the thing incredible? So much so, I don't believe it. Even from yourself, sir. <laughs> I know a way to make you credit it. No, no, you're telling us a fairy tale. I'm telling you just what will happen shortly. Stuff. Daughter, what I say is in good earnest. There, there, don't take your father seriously. He's fooling. But I tell you. No, no use. They won't believe you. If I let my anger. Well, then. We do believe you, and the worse for you it is. What? Can a grown man with that expanse of beard across his face be mad enough to want? Look, now you hark me. 
You've taken on yourself here in this house a sort of free familiarity that I don't like. I tell you frankly, girl. There, there. Let's not get angry, sir, I beg you. But are you making game of everybody? Your daughter's not cut out for bigot's meat. <gasps> and he has much more important things to think of. Besides, what can you gain by such a match? How can a man of wealth like you go choose a wretched vagabond for son-in-law? You hold your tongue. And no, the less he has, the better cause we have to honor him. His poverty is honest poverty. It should exalt him more than worldly grandeur, for he has let himself be robbed of all through careless disregard of temporal things and fixed attachment to the things eternal. My help may set him on his feet again, win back his property, a fair estate he has at home, so I'm informed, and prove him for what he is, a true-born gentleman. Yes, so he says himself. Such vanity but ill accords with pious living, sir. The man who cares for holiness alone should not so loudly boast his name and birth. The humble ways of genuine devoutness brook not so much display of earthly pride. Why should he be so vain? But I offend you. Let's leave his rank then. Take the man himself. Can you without compunction give a man like him possession of a girl like her? Think what a scandal sure to come of it. Virtue is at the mercy of the fates when a girl's married to a man she hates. The best intent to live an honest woman depends upon her husband's being human and men whose brows are pointed out afar may thank themselves their wives are what they are. For to be true is more than women can with husbands built upon a certain plan. And he who weds his child against her will owes heaven account for it if she do ill. Think then what perils wait on your design. So, I must learn from what's what from her, you see. <laughs> you might do worse than follow my advice. Daughter, we can't waste time upon this nonsense. I know what's good for you, and I'm your father. True, I had promised you to young Valère, but first they tell me he's inclined to gamble. And then I fear his faith is not quite sound. I haven't noticed that he's regular at church. You'd have him run there just when you do, like those who go on purpose to be seen. I don't ask your opinion on the matter. In short, the other is in heaven's best graces, and that is riches quite beyond compare. This match will bring you joy, every joy you long for. It will be all steeped in sweetness and delight. You live together in your faithful loves, like two sweet children, like two turtle doves. You'll never fail to quarrel, scold, or tease, and you may do with him whatever you please. With him? Do not but give him horns, I'll warrant. Out on the wretch. I'll tell you, he's cut out for it. However great your daughter's virtue, sir, his destiny is sure to prove the stronger. I've done with interrupting. Hold your tongue. Don't poke your nose in other people's business. If I make bold, sir, tis for your own good. You're too officious. Pray you hold your tongue. Tis love of you. I want none of your love. Then I will love you in my own despite. You will, eh? Yes, your honor's dear to me. I can't endure you to see you made bud of all men's ridicule. Oh, won't you be still? It would be a sin to let you make this match. Won't you be still, I say, you impudent viper? What? You are pious and you lose your temper? I'm all wrought up with your confounded nonsense. Now, once and for all, I tell you, hold your tongue. Then mum's the word. I'll take it out in thinking. Oh, think all you please, but not a syllable to me about it. Or, you understand, hmm? A wise father, I've considered all with due deliberation. I'll go mad if I can't speak. Though he's no ladies' man, Tartuffe is well enough. Pretty fizz. So that although you may not care at all for his best qualities. Handsome dowry. Were I in a place, any man should rue it who married me by force, and that's mighty certain. 
I let him know in that within a week, a woman's vengeance isn't far to seek. So, nothing that I say has any weight. Ah, huh? what's wrong now? I didn't speak to you. What were you doing? Talking to myself. Oh, but very well. Her monstrous impudence must be chastised with one good slap in the face. Mm. Daughter, uh, you must approve of my design. Think of this husband I have chosen for you. Well, why don't you talk to yourself? Nothing to say. One little word more? No, no, thanks. Not now. Sure. I'd have caught you. Faith, I'm no such fool. Yeah. So, uh, daughter, uh, um, now obedience is the word. You must accept my choice with reverence. You never catch me marrying such a creature. <laughs> oh. Daughter, you such a pestilent hussy there, I can't live with her longer without sin. I can't discuss things in the state I'm in. My mind's so flustered with her insolent talk to calm myself, I must go take a walk. Act two, scene three. Say, have you lost the tongue from out your head? And must I speak your role from A to Z? You let them broach a project that's absurd and don't oppose it with a single word. What can I do? My father is the master. Do? Everything to ward of such disaster. But what? Tell him what doesn't love by proxy. Tell him you'll marry for yourself, not him. Since you're the one for whom the thing is done, you are the one, not he, the man must please. If his tartuffe has charmed him so, why let him just marry him himself? No one will hinder. A father's rights are such, it seems to me, that I could never dare to, to say a word. Come, talk it out. Valera's asked her hand. Now, do you love him, pray, or do you not? Doreen, how can you love me so much and ask me such a question? Have I not a hundred times laid bare my heart to you? Do you know how ardently I love him? How do I know if heart and words agree? Now, if in honest truth, do you really love him? Doreen, you wrong me greatly if you doubt it. I've shown my inmost feelings all too plainly. So then you love him? Yes, devotedly. And he returns your love, apparently? I think so. And you both alike are eager to be well married to each other? Surely. Then what's your plan about this other match? To kill myself if it is forced upon me. Good. That's a remedy I hadn't thought of. Just die and everything will be all right. This medicine is marvelous indeed. It drives me mad to hear folk talk such nonsense. Oh, dear Doreen, you get in such a temper. You have no sympathy for people's troubles. I have no sympathy when folk talk nonsense and flatten out at, as you do at a pinch. But what can you expect if one is timid? But what is love worth if it has no courage? Am I not constant in my love for him? Is not his place to win me from my father? But if your father is a crazy fool and quite bewitched with his tartuffe and breaks his bonded word, is that your lover's fault? But shall I publicly refuse and scorn this match and make it plain that I'm in love? Shall I cast him off? Shall I cast off for him, whate'er he be, womanly modesty and filial duty? You ask me to display my love in public? No, no, I ask you nothing. You shall be Monsieur Tartuffe's. Why, now that I think of it, I should be wrong to turn you away from this marriage. What cause have I to oppose your wishes? So fine a match, an excellent good match. Monsieur Tatouf, oh, no mean proposal. Monsieur Tatouf, sure, take it all in all. Is not a man to sneeze at? Oh, by no means. Tis no small luck to be a happy spouse. The whole world joins to sing his praise already. He's noble in his age, handsome too, red ears and red complexion. Oh my lord, you'll be too happy sure with him for husband. Oh dear. What joy and pride will fill your heart to be the bride of such a handsome fellow. Oh stop, I beg you, try to find some way to help break off the match. I quite give in, I'm ready to do anything you say. No, no, a daughter must obey her father. Though he should want 
to make a red a monkey. Besides, your fate is fine. What could be better? You'll take the stagecoach to his little village and find it full of uncles and cousins who conversations will delight you. Then you'll be presented to their best society and you'll even go to call by way of welcome on Mrs. Bailiff, Mrs. Tax Collector, who will patronize you with a folding stool. There, once a year, you'll have perhaps a ball with orchestra, two bagpipes, and sometimes a trained ape and Punch and Judy. So if your husband- Oh, you'll kill me. Please contrive to help me out with your advice. I thank you kindly. Oh, Doreen, I beg you. To serve you right, this marriage must go through. Dear girl. No. If I say I love Valer. No, no, talk to your man and you shall taste him. You know I've always trusted you, now help me. No, no, shall be my faith. Tart twofold. Well then, since you've no pity for my fate, let me take counsel only of despair. It will advise and help give me courage. There's one sure cure I know for all my troubles. There, there, come back. I can't be angry long. I must take pity on you after all. Don't you see, Doreen, if I must bear this martyrdom, I certainly shall die. Now don't you fret. We'll surely find some way to hinder this. But there's Valer, your lover. Scene two, act, act two, scene four. Madam, a piece of news quite new to me has just come out and very fine it is. What piece of news? Your marriage with Tartuffe. Tis true, my father has this plan in mind. Your father, madam? Yes, he's changed his plans and did but now propose it to me. What? Seriously? Yes, he was serious and openly insisted on the match. And what's your resolution in the matter, madam? I don't know. That's a pretty answer. You don't know? No. No? But what do you advise? I? My advice is marry him by all means. That's your advice? Yes. Do you mean it? Surely. A splendid choice and worthy of your acceptance. Oh, oh very well, sir. I shall take your counsel. You'll find no trouble taking it, I warrant. No more than you did giving it, be sure. I gave it truly, madam, to oblige you. And I shall take it to oblige you, sir. Doreen, let's see what this affair will come to. So that is your love? And it was all deceit when you- I beg you, say no more of that. You told me squarely, sir, I should, should accept the husband that is offered me. And I will tell you squarely that I mean to do so since you have given me this good advice. No, don't shield yourself with talk of my advice. You had your mind made up. That's evident. And now you're snatching at a trifling pretext to justify the breaking of your word. <laughs> exactly so. Of course it is. Your heart has never known true love for me. Alas, <laughs> you're free to think so, if you please. Yes, yes, I'm free to think so. And my outraged love may it forestall you into perfidy and offer elsewhere both my heart and hand. Oh, no doubt of it, the love your high deserts may win. Oh, good Lord, have done with my deserts. I know I have but few, and you have proved it, but I may find more kindness in another. I know of someone who will not be ashamed to take your leavings and make up my loss. The loss is not so great. You'll easily console yourself completely for this change. I'll try my best. That you may well believe. When we're forgotten by a woman's heart, our pride is challenged. We too must forget. Or if we cannot, must at least pretend to. No other way can such can man such baseness prove as be a lover scorned and still in love. In faith, a high and noble sentiment. Yes. And it's one that all men must approve. What, would you have me keep my love alive and see you fly in another's arms before my very eyes and never offer to someone else the heart that you had scorned? Oh no, indeed, for my part, I could wish that it were done already. What? You wish it? Yes. <laughs> this is an insult that you've done injury. I'll go at once <sighs> and if you desire. Oh, very well then. But remember this, twas you that gave, drove me to this desperate pass. Of course. And the plan that I have formed, I only followed your example. Yes. 
Enough, you shall be punctually obeyed. Oh, so much the better. This once for all. So be it then. Eh? What? You, you, didn't, you didn't call me? I? You are dreaming. Uh, but very well. I'm gone, madam. Farewell. Farewell, sir. I must say you've lost your senses and both gone clean daft. I've let you fight it out to the end of the chapter to see how far things could go. Oh, oh there, Mr. Valier. What do you want, Doreen? Come here. No, oh, no, I'm quite beside myself. Don't hinder me from doing as she wishes. Stop. No! You see, I'm fixed, resolved, determined. So? Since my presence paints him, make him go. I'd better go myself and leave him free. Now, Tother, where are you going? Let me be. Come back. No, no, isn't any use. It's clear the sight of me is torture to her. No doubt, twere better I should free her from it. Same thing again. Deuce take you both, I say. Now stop your fooling. Come here, you and you. What's your idea? What can you mean to do? Set you to rights and pull you out or the scrape. Are you quite mad to quarrel with her now? Didn't you hear the things she said to me? Are you quite mad to get in such a passion? Didn't you see the way he treated me? Fools both of you. She thinks of nothing else but to keep faith with you, I vouch for it. And he loves none but you and longs for nothing but just to marry you, I stake my life on it. Why did you give me such advice then, pray? Why ask for my advice in such a matter? You are both daft, I tell you here. Your hands come, yours. What for? And now yours. But what's the use? Oh, quick now, come along. There are both of you. You love each other better than you think. Come, don't be so ungracious about now about it. Look at a man as if you didn't hate him. My faith and troth, what fools these lovers be. But come now, have I not a just complaint? And truly, are you not a wicked creature to take delight in saying what would pain me? And are you not yourself the most ungrateful? Leave this discussion until another time. Now, think how you will stave off this plague on marriage. Then tell us how to go about it. Well, we'll try all sorts of ways. Your father's daft. This plan is nonsense. You better humor his notions with a semblance of consent so that in case of danger, you can still find means to block the marriage by delay. If you gain time, the rest is easy, trust me. One day you'll fool with them with a sudden illness, causing delay, another day ill amends. You've met a funeral or broken mirror or dreamed of muddy water. Best of all, they cannot marry you to anyone without your saying yes. But now me thinks they mustn't find you chattering together. You, go at once and set your friends at work to make him keep his word to you, while we will bring the brother's influence to bear and get the stepmother on our side too. Goodbye. Whatever efforts we may make, my greatest hope to be sure must rest on you. I cannot answer for my father's whims, but no one save Valer shall ever have me. <laughs> you thrill me with joy. Whatever comes. Oh, oh, these lovers never done with prattling. Now go. Wait, one last word. What a gabber and a pother. Be off. By this door you, and you by t'other. Act three, scene one. May lightning strike me dead this very instant. May I be everywhere proclaimed a scoundrel if any reverence or power shall stop me, and if I don't do straight away something desperate. I beg you, moderate this towering passion. Your father bit, did but merely mention it. <sighs> Not all things that are talked of turn to facts. The road is long, sometimes from plan to acts. No, I must end this paltry fellow's plots, and he shall hear from me a truth or two. So ho, go slow now. Just do leave the fellow, your father too, in your stepmother's hands. 
She has some influence with this Tartuffe and makes a point of heeding all she says. And I suspect he's fond of her. Would God for true, twould be the height of humor. Now, she has sent for him in your behalf to sound him on this marriage, to find out what his ideas are and to show him plainly what troubles he may cause if he persists in giving countenance to this design. Mm. His man says he's at prayers. I mustn't see him, but likewise says he's pre he'll presently be down. So off with you and let me wait for him. I may be present at this interview. No, no, they must be left alone. I won't so much as speak to him. Go on. We know you and your high tantrums. Just the way to spoil things. Be off. D no, I must see. I'll, I'll keep my temper. Out on you. What a plague. He's coming. Hide. Scene three, act, uh, act three, scene two. Lawrence, I put up my hair, cloth, shirt, and scourge, and pray that heaven may shed its light upon you. If any come to see me, say I'm gone to share my arms among the prisoners. What affectation, what showing off. What do you want with me? To tell you... Oh, before you speak, pray, take this handkerchief. Cover up that bosom, which I can't endure to look on. Things like that offend our souls and fill our minds with sinful thoughts. Are you so tender to temptation then? And has flesh such power upon your senses? I don't know how you get in such a heat. For my part, I, I am not so prone to lust and I could see you stripped from head to foot and all your hide not tempt me in the least. You, in your speech, some little modesty, or I must instantly take leave of you. No, no, I'll leave you to yourself. I've only one thing to say. Madame will soon be down and begs the favor of a word with you. Ah, willingly. How gentle all at once. My faith, I still believe I've hit upon it. Uh, will she come soon? I think I hear her now. Yes, here she is herself. I'll leave you with her. Act three, scene three. Oh, may heaven's overflowing kindness ever give you good health of body and of soul, and bless your days according to the wishes and prayers of its most humble votary. <clears throat> I am very grateful for your pious wishes, but let's sit down so we may talk at ease. And how are you recovered from your illness? Oh, quite well. The fever soon let go its hold. Oh, my prayers, I fear, have not sufficient merits to have drawn down this favour from on high. Uh, but each entreaty that I made to heaven had uh, for its object your recovery. You're too solicitous on my behalf. Oh, we could not cherish your dear health too much. I would have given mine to help restore it. That's pushing Christian charity too far. I owe you many thanks for so much kindness. I do far less for you than you deserve. There is a matter that I wish to speak of in private. I am glad there's no one here to listen. Madam, I am overjoyed. It is sweet to find myself alone with you. This is an opportunity I've asked of heaven many a time till now, in vain. All that I wish is just a word from you, quite frank and open, hiding nothing from me. I too could wish, as heaven's a special favour, to lay my soul quite open to your eyes and swear to you the trouble that I have made about those visits which your charms attract it does not result from any hatred towards you, but rather a passionate devotion and purest motives. Oh, that's how I take it. I think tis my salvation that concerns you. Madam, tis so, and such is my devotion. Oh, 
but you squeeze too hard. Excessive zeal. In no way could I ever mean to hurt you, and I'd as soon... <gasps> uh, what's your hand doing there? Feeling your gown. The stuff is very soft. Uh, let be. I beg you. <laughs> I am very ticklish. <laughs> Dear me. How wonderful in workmanship this lace is. They do marvels nowadays. Things of all kinds were never better made. Uh, yes, very true. Uh, but let us come to business. Uh, they say my husband means to break his word. And Maria, Marianne, to you. Is it so? Um, he did hint some such thing. But truly, madam, that's not the happiness I'm yearning for. I see elsewhere the sweet, compelling charms of such a joy as fills my every wish. Uh, you, you mean you cannot love terrestrial things? Uh, the heart within my bosom is not stone. <sighs> I well believe your sighs all tend to heaven, and nothing here below can <laughs> stay your thoughts. Love for the beauty of eternal things cannot destroy our love for earthly beauty. Our mortal senses may well may be entranced by perfect works that heaven has fashioned here. Its charms reflected shine in such as you. And in yourself, its rarest miracles has displayed such marvels in your face that eyes are dazed and hearts are wrapped away. I could not look on you, a perfect creature, without admiring nature's great creator and feeling all my heart inflamed with love for you. <sighs> there is the image of himself at first. I trembled lest this secret love might be the evil spirit's artful snare. I even schooled my heart to flee your beauty, <clears throat> thinking it was a bar to my salvation. But soon, enlightened, oh, lovely one, I saw how this my passion may be blameless, how I may make it fit with modesty and thus completely yield my heart to it. It is, I must own, a great presumption in me to dare make you the offer of my heart. My love hopes all things from your perfect goodness and nothing from my own poor, weak endeavour. You are my hope, my stay, my peace of heart. On you depends my torment or my bliss. And by your doom of judgment, I shall be blessed, if you will, or damned if by your decree. Oh, your declarations turned most gallantly. But truly, it is just a bit surprising. You should have better armed your heart, methinks, and taken thought somewhat on such a matter. A, a pious man like you know everywhere. Oh, pious, I am nonetheless a man. And when a man beholds your heavenly charms, the heart surrenders and can think no more. I know such words seem strange coming from me, but, madam, I'm no angel after all. If you condemn, I frankly made a vow, you have only your charming self to blame. Soon as I saw your more than human beauty, you were thenceforth the sovereign of my soul. Sweetness ineffable was in your eyes that took by storm my still resisting heart and conquered everything, fasts, prayers, and tears, and turned my worship wholly to yourself. My looks, my sighs, have spoken a thousand times. Now, to express it all, my voice must speak. If you 
but will look down with gracious favour upon the sorrows of your worthless slave. If in your goodness you will give me comfort and condescend unto my nothingness, I'll ever pay you, O oh sweet miracle, an unexampled worship and devotion. Then, too, with me your honour runs no risk. With me, you need not fear a public scandal. These court gallants that women are so fond of are boastful of their acts and vain in speech. They always brag in public of their progress. As soon as a favour's granted, they'll divulge it. Their tackling tongues, if you but trust to them, will foul the altar where their hearts have worshipped. But uh, men like me are so discreet in love that you may trust their lasting secrecy. The care we take to guard our own good name may fully guarantee the one we love. So you may find, with hearts like ours, sincere love without scandal, pleasure without fear. I've heard you through. Your speech is clear, at least. But don't you fear that I may take a fancy to tell my husband of your gallant passion and that prompt report of this affair may somewhat change the friendship which he bears you? I know that you're too good and generous, that you will pardon my temerity. Excuse upon the score of human frailty, the violence of passion that offends you, and not forget uh, when you consult your mirror that I'm not blind, and man is made of flesh. Some women might do otherwise, perhaps, but I am willing to employ discretion and not repeat the matter to my husband. But in return, I'll ask one thing of you. Mm. That you urge forward, frankly and sincerely, the marriage of Valère to Marianne that you give up the unjust influence by which you hope to win another's rights and no, I say. This thing must be made public. I was just there and overheard it all. And heaven's goodness must have brought me there on purpose to confound this scoundrel's pride and grant me means to take a signal vengeance on his hypocrisy and arrogance. And to undeceive my father, showing up the rascal caught at making love to you! No! No, it is enough if he reforms. Endeavoring to deserve the favor shown him, and since I've promised, do not you belie me. Tis not my way to make a public scandal. An honest wife will scorn to heed such follies and never fret her husband's ears with them. You've reasons of your own for acting thus, and I have mine for doing otherwise. To spare him now would be a mockery. His Bigot's pride has triumphed all too long over my righteous anger and has caused far too much trouble in our family. The rascal all too long has ruled my father and crossed my sister's love and mine as well. The traitor now must be unmasked before him and providence has given me means to do it. To heaven I owe this opportunity and if I did not use it now I have it, I should deserve to lose it once for all. Dami! No! By your leave, I'll not be counseled. <laughs> I'm overjoyed. You needn't try to tell me I must give up the pleasure of revenge. I'll make an end of this affair at once, and to content me, here's my father now. <laughs> Act three, scene five. Father! Ah, uh, we've news to welcome your arrival. That's altogether novel and surprising. You are well paid for your caressing care, and this fine gentleman rewards your love most handsomely with zeal that seeks no less than your honor, as has now been proven. I've just surprised him, making to your wife the shameful, shameful offer of a guilty love. Hmm? 
She, somewhat over-gentle and discreet, insisted that the thing should be concealed. But I will not condone such shamelessness, nor so far wrong you as to keep it secret. Yes, I believe a wife should never trouble her husband's peace of mind with such vain gossip. A woman's honor does not hang on telling. It is enough if she defend herself. Or so I think, dummies. If you did not have spoken, if you would have but heeded my advice. Act three, scene six. Just heaven. Can what I hear be credited? Yes, brother, I am wicked. I am guilty, a miserable sinner steeped in evil, the greatest criminal that ever lived. Each moment of my life is stained with soilures, and all is but a mass of crime and filth. Heaven for my punishment, I see it plainly would mortify me now, whatever wrong they find to charge me with. I'll not deny it, but guard against the pride of self-defense. Believe their stories, arm your wrath against me, and drive me like a villain from your house. I cannot have so great a share of shame, but what I have deserved a greater still. You miscreant, can you dare with such a falsehood to try to stain the whiteness of his virtue? What? The feigned meekness of this hypocrite makes you discredit the... Silence! Cursed plague! Oh, let him speak! You chide him wrongfully. It is far oh. better to believe his tales. Why favor me so much in such a matter? How can you know of what I'm capable? You thrust my outward semblance, brother, or judge therefrom therefrom that I'm the better man. No, no, you let appearances deceive you. I'm anything but what I'm thought to be. Alas, and though all men believe me godly, the simple truth is I'm a worthless creature. Yes, my dear son, say on and call me traitor, abandoned scoundrel, thief and murderer, heap on me names yet more detestable, and I shall not gainsay you. I gainsay you, I have deserved them. I'll bear this ignominy on my knees to expiate in shame the crimes that I have done. Ah, brother, tis too much. You'll not relent, you blackguard. What? His talk can so deceive you that- Silence, you scoundrel! Brother, rise, I beg you. Infamous villain! Can he just get away- Silence! What? Another word, I'll break your every bone. Brother, in God's name, don't be angry with him. I bear myself the bitterest torture than have, he, have him get a scratch on my account. A grateful monster! Stop! Upon my knees, I beg you, pardon him. Alas, how can you, villain, behold his goodness? So ye- Be still. What? Be I still, I say. I know your motives for this attack. You hate him, all of you. Wife, children, servants, all let loose upon him. You have the recourse to every shameful trick to drive this godly man out of my house. The more you try to rid yourselves of him, the more I'll strive to make him stay with me. I'll have him straightway married to my daughter just to confound the pride of all of you. What? Will you force her to accept his hand? Yes, and this very evening to enrage you, young rascal. <laughs> I'll brave you all and show you that I'm the master and must be obeyed. Now, down upon your knees this instant rogue and take back what you said and ask his pardon. Who? I? Ask pardon of that cheating scoundrel? Do you resist? 
You beggar and insult him. A cudgel here, a cudgel. Oh, no, 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 don't restrain me. Off with you. Leave my house this instant, sir, and never dare set foot in it again. Yes, I will leave your house, but ye leave it quickly, you reprobate. I disinherit you and give you to my curse into the bargain. Act three, scene seven. What? So insult a saintly man of God? Heaven forgive him all the pain he gives me. Could you but know what distress I see them try to vilify me to my brother? Uh, oh, the mere thought of such ingratitude makes my soul suffer torture bitterly. My horror at it. Oh, my heart so full I cannot speak. I think I'll die a bit. Oh, scoundrel, I wish I'd never let you go, but slain you on the spot with my own hand. Brother, compose yourself and don't be angry. Hey, brother, let us end these painful quarrels. I see what troublous times I bring upon you and think tis needful that I leave this house. Oh, yes. What? You can't mean it. Yes. They hate me here and try, I find, to make you doubt my faith. What of it? Do you find I listen to them? No, no doubt they won't stop there. These same reports you now reject may some day win a hearing. No, oh, brother, never. Oh, my friend, a woman may easily mislead her husband's mind. Oh, no. So uh, let me uh, quickly go away and thus remove all cause for such attacks. No, no, you shall stay here. My life depends upon it. Then I must mortify myself. I, yet, uh, if you should wish that I... Uh, no, never. Very well, then. I do more of that. Uh, I, but I shall uh, rule my conduct to fit the case. Honour is delicate, and friendship binds me to forestall suspicion, prevent all scandal, and avoid your wife. No, you shall haunt her just to spite them all. Well, it is my delight to set them in a rage. You shall be seen together at all hours. And what is more, the better to defy them, I'll have no other heir but you. And straightway I'll go make a deed of gift to you, drawn in due form of all my property. Ah, oh, good, true friend, my son-in-law to be, is more to me than son and wife and kindred. You will accept my offer, will you not? Heaven's will be done in everything. Oh, poor man. We'll go make haste to draw the deed aright, and then let envy burst itself with spite. Intermission. So it's 2.15. We'll take a 10-minute intermission. Uh, we'll meet again. We'll start again at 2.25. Thank you, 2.25. Thank you, 2.25. <laughs> nice job, everyone. Yeah, pretty good. Paul, are you here? Are you here? Are you listening? Maybe not. Steve, I saw an RSC production with Anthony Scherer in which in the scene he just did, he smeared strawberry jam on his palms and then pretended to go into a crucif crucifixion position. And then he opened his hands to Argon to reveal fake stigmata. And then when Argon's face, Argon was back, was turned, he quickly licked it off, held out his hands to him again, and the stigmata were supposedly gone. <laughs> That's brilliant. Nearer my God to thee. <laughs> yeah, the problem with this translation is, I mean, the translator obviously knows it's written in rhyme. Mm. Uh, and the original French was very tight rhyme. Uh, but not being desperately bright, all the best he could come up with is translate it into what he understood as poetry, which is pentameters. The whole damn thing is written in pentameters. Now, the French don't 
speak in pentrameters. They never have. The, the language is such that their rhythms are totally different. Yeah, I know. The, uh, also to an Alexandrine, um, mm. from what I understand, than a pentameter for French. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. That's right. The closest that uh, it's come is the Richard Wilbur translations, but they're still in copyright. So Paul. Well, I, I, Alexandrines are octameters, aren't they? And it's actually hard to do in English anyway. Yeah, that's right. They had the same problem with Spanish translations. And when you speak in Spanish, they tend to go better into eights, fours, and twelves than fives and tens. Um, yeah, that's a characteristic, I think, of the Latin, the yeah, more absolutely. derivative Latin language. I, I actually was in a production of this at the um, uh, the uh, uh, Depot Theatre up in Garrison. And the translation we used there was... Uh, Gemma Bodinets of the Liverpool Everyman and Playhouse Theatres commissioned a new translation by Roger McGuff, uh, who's one of the great Liverpool poets. And that was wonderful. Uh, you almost got sucked into the text uh, and thinking it's not really rhyming. And then suddenly he'd hit you with a rhyme that boom, boom, boom. Um, it was lovely. Yeah. Well, you actually have the same problem with the Greeks as well. I mean, mm, yeah, some of the you know trans translating some of those Greek, um, it, it's simply because that even just the words that they use have different meanings. The one that immediately comes to mind is there is no word in Greek for goddess. For oh, really? The female god is called a she god. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah and then, but you know, there's a whole range of them which I can't remember now. But, yeah. There are so many languages that have the problem. I mean, it, it, you try and translate uh, Chekhov and Russian does not have um, a definite article. Uh, it doesn't exist, which is why people get into all these arguments about whether it's seagull or the seagull. The sea. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people get all incensed, you've translated it wrong. And they say, no, uh, you have to translate the intent. Um, and yeah. it's always the same with these things. I mean, if it's this bad in theatre, can you just imagine what it's like translating opera libretti? Oh, God. <laughs> you but, this is, but this is also why translating Ibsen is so difficult, yes. because at the time he was writing, um, there really wasn't uh, a Norwegian language. It was still largely um, uh, Danish. The Dutch, Danish, yeah, uh, because they were still owned by Denmark. And the introduction of the Norwegian language didn't come till much later. So uh, taking modern Norwegian, Norwegian and trying to use that to translate Ibsen creates enormous problems. It's just difficult. Well, it's not dissimilar to, tra it's, it's not dissimilar to translating Shakespeare into modern English. Well, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But... That's why doing this thing in pen, in, in such rigid pentameters, um, makes a very old English sound to it, uh, which is not necessarily what you need for this. Yeah. I'm going to have to disappear visually for a moment because I notice my screen has got these ripples on it, which are coming from my LED lights that I'm using, and it's I'm going to replace them minutes. with something that doesn't. Yeah. yeah, good. Okay. Great work, everybody. I'm having a great time. <laughs> uh, Derek, last time I did this, I actually paid Cleant, and that's what I was going to do tonight. Oh, until, really? Okay. Until, until um, uh, Paul realized he was going to have to be working and dealing with letter boxes and the like. Okay. You did a great job. Well done, sir. Is, is anybody else cold reading this? Yes. Yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, actually, I find that the translation, as poor as it is as a translation, it actually helps the fact that I didn't really have a chance to read the translation before I did this. And yeah, it, it you know, times... I, I am actually literally sight reading the translation. And because it's sort of like modernized pentameters, I find it it trips. It, 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 it's a bit it's a bit jagged. <laughs> Yeah. But I find that jaggedness gives you gives you room to um, have those little flubs that we have as 
even as I'm speaking now, of just trying to think of the next thing and being so confounded with it that I can't. And then the next line goes, you know, it's, it's, it, it kind of works for me in a way. I, I, I find, <laughs> I see it work for you guys too. It's really like, um, not trippingly off the tongue, but trippingly off the mind. <laughs> how, do you, how do you get that blue screen? This, this one. Yeah. What is this, that? This, uh, oh, this is a, uh, a little backdrop. See here. Oh. Oh, okay. I can put the link of it in um, in the chat. It's it's actually relatively inexpensive. It was only about maybe forty five fifty dollars, but I found it to be really. Yeah, it's great if you want to do monologues and things and <gasps> things and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I teach hard. I teach kids on on Zoom, and um, I find this to be like a perfect neutral right backdrop for them, just to keep their attention long enough. <laughs> <laughs> If anybody wants an audio copy of the uh, Wilbur translation, a production that was done by the Stratford Festival, just let me know. The audio copy? No, it was a yeah. It's an audio. It's an audio. It's an audio that was done of an actual production by the Stratford Festival, starring Brian Bedford, I believe, as uh, yeah, Orgon. You send an email of it, right? I can send. I can send it to you via email. Yes. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, just let, let me for, know via give me send me your email address and I'll have it out to you as ASAP. Okay. Yeah. Tony, do you have a copy of the um, uh, the Seattle Rep production from about thirty years ago? Seattle Rep? No, I'm afraid yeah, I, I, don't, it, I don't make copies that of those. Was really, really good. And I wondered whether they'd recorded it. You know, not necessarily video, but audio only. Well, sometimes YouTube does have audio, just strictly audio. Uh, yeah. Uploads. Well, a lot of the Cademan Shakespeare's are, uh, and some of the other stuff are on YouTube, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> I, I, it, was all, it was also done as a, Chuck was also done as a 50 minute radio program back in the days of old time radio. I still it's listen to BBC. Sh no, no, the sh it was on, <laughs> I believe it was N either Mutual or NBC and the program was called Great Plays. <laughs> <laughs> Did, did you say great plays or great praise? Great, great <laughs> plays. <laughs> that you can find that on the Internet Archive. Yeah. Oh. Hey, hey, Steve. I, uh, Stephen, you're from you're from Britain. Have you heard of Upstart Crow? Yeah. And do you do you like it? Or, I can see how somebody wouldn't, but I really dug. I really dig it. <laughs> I, you know what? I haven't. I mean, but you're talking to someone who did not like TW three or. <gasps> You know, even... <laughs> Heresy, Stephen. What, what was your opinion on horrible histories? I don't watch it. I find it. I find it silly. Oh, I loved it. No, I mean, <laughs> the live action version. Not you know, I, felt, I felt that about the Goo Goo and I also felt that about Monty Python. You know, I, I, for somehow or another, I could never get the humor. Um, oh, it's yeah. That's a pity. <laughs> I, the upstart crow, uh, Miguel. Have you seen the episode? that includes Hamnet's death. Yes, and that actually, oh. a, a, sitcom, a, a sitcom kind of comedy to get really kind of serious like that. Oh yeah, and the closing it, minute, because for those who don't know, every episode ends with Shakespeare and his wife just sitting and talking. And in that one, after Hamnet's death, they just sit there in silence and the voice overcomes. Now it, it's about, yeah, the, yeah, the empty halls and the empty clothes, the that space that bring used back to be the memories. Yeah, yeah, and it's absolutely fabulous. And the rest of it and, is all really slapstick kind of. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's word, the one, um, like um, the bawling brooks in your puffling pants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my wife hates them. I love them. Yeah. I think they're they're uh, they're I really clever. Good. They're clever. They're terribly clever. Speaking yeah. of which, I, 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 I was never a great fan of Absolutely Fabulous either. <laughs> oh, <laughs> are you even British, Stephen? I'm more British than you are. I will. <laughs> it was interesting. When I, when I first came over to the States, there were a bunch of kids at the college I was working at, and they used to have Monty Python nights because it was broadcast on PBS, and they invited me around, and it was hysterical watching it mm. because the understanding of the humor was totally different. They loved 
all the slapstick, all the falling about, all the bumping into things and knocking people over. Whereas I loved all the totally bizarre humor where you make somebody do something totally aberrant in a perfectly normal situation. Like and Hamlet it, being psychoanalyzed? By yeah, a, a oh yeah, wonderful stuff. I don't always get the references with British television, but I, I get the spirit. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It was a little. All right. Well, we I'm hearing I'm the bell ring. So. <laughs> Thank you for bringing up. <laughs> All right. So we'll see you soon on, on Act Four. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Thank you. So Act Four, Scene One. Yes, it's become all the talk of the town and make a stir that's scarcely to your credit. And I have met you, sir, most opportunely to tell you in a word my frank opinion, not to sift out scandal to the bottom. Suppose the worst for us. Suppose Damis acted the traitor and accused you falsely. Should not a, a Christian pardon this offense and stifle in his heart all wish for vengeance? Should you permit that for your petty quarrel, a, a son be driven from his father's house? I tell you yet again and tell you frankly, everyone high or low is scandalized. If you take my advice, you'll make it up and not push matters to extremities. Make sacrifice to God of your resentment. Restore the son to favor with his father. Alas. So far as I'm concerned, how gladly would I do so? I bear him no ill will. I pardon all, lay nothing to his charge, and wish him with all my heart that I might serve him. But heaven's interests cannot allow it. If he returns, then I must leave the house. After his conduct, quite unparalleled, all intercourse between us would bring scandal. God knows what everyone's first thought would be. They would attribute it to merest scheming on my part, say that conscious of my guilt, I feigned a Christian love for my accuser, and but feared him in my heart and hoped to win him and underhandedly secure his silence. You try to put us off with specious phrases, but all your arguments are too far-fetched. Why take upon yourself the cause of heaven? Does heaven need our help to punish sinners? Leave to itself the care of its own vengeance, but, and keep in mind the pardon it commands us. Besides, think somewhat less of men's opinions when you are following the will of heaven. Shall petty fear of what the world may think prevent the doing of a noble deed? No. Let us always do as heaven commands and not perplex our brains with further questions. Already I have told you I forgive him. And that is doing, sir, as heaven commands. But after this day's scandal and affront, heaven does not order me to live with him. And does it order you to lend your ear to what mere whim suggested to his father and to accept gifts of his estates on which injustice you can make no claim? No one who knows me, sir, can have the thought that I am acting from a selfish motive. The goods of all this world have no charms for me. I am not dazzled by their treacherous glamour. And if I bring myself to take the gift which he insists on giving me, I do so, to tell the truth, only because I fear this whole estate may fall into bad hands, and those to whom it comes may use it ill and not employ it, as is my design for heaven's glory and my neighbor's good. <laughs> Sir, give up these conscientious scruples that well may cause a rightful heir's complaint. Don't take so much upon yourself but let him possess what's his at his own risk and peril. Consider it. it. It were better he misused it than you should be accused of robbing him. I'm astounded that unblushingly you could allow such offers to be made. Tell me, has true religion any maxim that teaches us to rob the lawful heir? 
If heaven has made it quite impossible that me and you should live together here, were it not better you should quietly and honorably withdraw than let the sun be driven out for your sake, dead against all reason? Could be giving, sir, believe me, such an example of your probity. Sir, it is half past three. There are certain devotions recall me to my closet. Do you forgive me for leaving you so soon? Oh. Act four, scene two. Sir, we beg you to help us all you can in her behalf. She's suffering almost more than heart can bear. This match her father's means to make tonight drives each moment to despair. He's coming. Let us unite our efforts now, we beg you, and try by strength or skill to change his purpose. Act four, scene three. So, ho, oh, I'm glad to find you all together. Here is the contract, now oh, there you are, which shall make you happy, my dear. You know already what it means. Father, I beg you in the name of heaven that knows my, my grief and by whatever can move you, relax a little your paternal rights and free my love from disobedience. Oh, do not make me by your harsh command complain to heaven that you ever were my father. Do not make wretched this poor life you gave me if crossing that fond hope which I had formed, you'll not permit me to belong to one whom I have dared to love. At least I beg you upon my knees, oh, save me from the torment of being possessed by one whom I abhor. And do not drive me to some desperate act by exercising all your rights upon me. Oh, come, come, my heart, be firm. No human weakness. I am not jealous of your love for him. Display it freely, give him your estate. And if that's not enough, add all of mine. I willingly agree and give it up. If only you'll not give him me, your daughter. Oh, rather let a convent's rigid, rigid rule wear out the wretched days that heaven allots me. Uh, oh, I've lost the place. 83. Girls are oh, These girls are ninnies, always turning nuns. When fathers thwart their silly love affairs, get on your feet. The more you hate to have him, the more it will help you earn your soul's salvation. So mortify your senses by this marriage and don't vex me about it any more. But what? You hold your tongue before your betters. Don't dare to say a single word, I tell you. If you will let me answer and advise. Brother! I value your advice most highly. It is well thought out. No better can be had. But you'll allow me not to follow it. I can't find words to cope with such a case. Your blindness makes me quite astounded at you. You are bewitched with him to disbelieve the things we tell you happened here today. I am your humble servant and can see things when they're as plain as noses on folks' faces. I know you're partial to my rascal son and didn't dare to disavow the trick he tried to play on this poor man. Besides, you were too calm to be believed. If that had happened, you'd have been far more disturbed. And must our honor always rush to arms at the mere mention of illicit love? Or can we answer no attack upon it except with blazing eyes and lips and scorn? Huh. For my part, I just laugh away such nonsense. I've no desire to make allowed to do. Our virtue, I think, I, our virtue should, I think, be gentle natured. Nor can I quite approve of those savage prudes whose, whose honor arms itself with teeth and claws to tear men's eyes out at the slightest word. Heaven preserve me from that kind of honor. I like my virtue not to be a vixen, and I believe a quiet, cold rebuff no less effective to repulse a lover. I know, and you can't throw me off the scent. Once more, I am astounded at your weakness. Oh. I wonder what your I wonder what your unbelief would answer if I should let you see we've told the truth. See it. Yes, 
Nonsense! Come! If I should find a way to make you see it clear as day. Oh, rubbish! Oh, what a mess. But answer me. I'm not proposing now that you believe us, but let's suppose that here, from proper hiding, you should be made to see and hear all plainly what would you say then to your man of virtue? Why, then I'd say, say nothing. It cannot be. Your error has endured too long already, and quite too long you've branded me a liar. I must at once, for my own satisfaction, make you a witness of the things we've told you. Amen. I take you at your word. We'll see what tricks you have and how you keep your promise. Send him to me. The man's a crafty codger. Perhaps you'll find it difficult to catch him. <laughs> oh, no. A lover is never hard to cheat. And self-conceit leads straight to self-deceit. Bid him come down to me. <laughs> And, oh, and bid him come down, and you, withdraw. Act four, scene four. Now bring up this table and get under it. What? One essential is to hide you well. But why under there? Oh, dear, do as I say. <sighs> I, I know what I'm about. As you shall see, get under now. I'll tell you. And once there, be careful no one sees or hears you. Going a long way to humor you, I must say. But I, I'll see you through your scheme. And then you'll have, I think, no more to say. But mind, I'm going to meddle with strange matters. Prepare yourself to be in no wise shocked. Whatever I say must pass, because it is only to convince you, as I promised. By wheedling speeches, since I'm forced to do it, I'll make this hypocrite put off his mask flatter the longings of his shameless passion, and give free play to all his impudence. But since it is for your sake to prove to you his guilt that I shall feign to share his love, I can leave off as soon as you're convinced, and things shall go no farther than you choose. So when you think they've gone quite far enough, it is for you to stop his mad pursuit, to spare your wife and not expose me farther, then you shall need yourself to undeceive you. It is your own affair, and you must end it. When yeah. he comes, keep still, don't show yourself. Act four, scene five. They told me that you wish to see me here. Yes. I have secrets for your ear alone. But shut the door first. And look everywhere for fear of spies. We surely can't afford another scene like that we had just now. Was ever anyone so caught before? Don, you did frighten me most terribly. On your account, you saw I did my best to baffle his design and calm his anger, but I was so confused. I never thought to, to contradict his story still, thank heaven. Things turned out all the better as it happened, and now we're on an even safer footing. The high esteem you're held in laid the storm. My husband can have no suspicion of you, and even insists, despite the scandal mongers, that we shall be together constantly. So that is how, without the risk of blame, I can be here locked up with you alone, and can reveal to you my heart, perhaps, only too ready to allow your passion. Your words are somewhat hard to understand, madam. Just now you used a different style. If that refusal has offended you, how little do you know a woman's heart? How ill you guess what it would have no would how ill you guess what it would have you know when it presents so feeble a defense. Always, at first, our modesty resists the tender feelings you inspire us with. Whatever cause we find to justify the love that masters us, we still must feel. Some little shame in owning it and strive to make us as though we would not when we would. But from the very way we go about it, we let a lover know our heart surrenders. The while our lips 
for honor's sake oppose our heart's desire and in refusing promise. I'm telling you my secret all too freely and with too little heed to modesty, but now that I've been made bold to speak, pray tell me, should I have tried to keep them east from speaking? Should I have heard the offer of your heart so quietly and suffered all your pleading and taken it just as I did? Remember, if such a declaration had not pleased me, and when I tried my utmost to persuade you not to accept the marriage that was talked of, what should my earnestness have hinted to you, if not the interest that you've inspired? And my chagrin, should such a match compel me to share a heart I want all to myself? It is... Uh... Past a doubt, the height of happiness to hear such words from lips we dote upon. Their honeyed sweetness pours through all my senses, long draughts of suavity inevitable, ineffable. My heart employs its utmost zeal to please you and count your love its one beatitude. And yet, that heart must beg that you allow it to doubt a little its felicity. I well may think these words an honest trick to make me break off this approaching marriage. And if I may express myself quite plainly, I cannot trust these two enchanting words until the granting of some little favour I sigh for, they shall assure me of their truth and build within my soul on firm foundations a lasting faith in your sweet charity. <laughs> oh, what? But you go so fast and all at once exhaust the whole love of a woman's heart. Uh, she does herself the violence to make this dear confession of her love, and you are not yet satisfied and will not be without the granting of her utmost favour. The less a blessing is deserved, the less we dare to hope for it. And words alone can ill assuage our love's desires. A fate too full of happiness seems doubtful still. We must enjoy it ere we can believe it, and I, who know how little I deserve your goodness, doubt the fortunes of my daring. Uh, so I shall trust to nothing, madam, till you have convinced my love by something real. Oh, how your love enacts the tyrant's role and throws my mind into a strange confusion. Wow, with what fierce sway it rules a conquered heart and violently will have its wishes granted. What? Is there no escape from your pursuit? No respite even, not a breathing space? <laughs> it seems to be so exactly and so abused by urgency, the weakness that you may discover a woman's heart. Not, if my worship wins your gracious favor, then why refuse me some sure proof thereof? But how can I consent to what you wish without offending heaven, of, of whom you talk so much? If heaven is all that stands now in my way, I'll easily remove that little hindrance. Your heart need not hold back for such a trifle. Oh, but they affright us so with heaven's commands. I can dispel these foolish fears, dear madam. I know the art of pacifying scruples. Heaven forbids, it is true, some satisfactions, but we may find means to make things right with heaven. There is a science, madam, that instructs us how to enlarge the limits of our conscience according to our various occasions and rectify the evil of the deed according to the purity of motive. I'll duly teach you all these secrets, madam, if only you need, if only, if you only need to let yourself be guided, content my wishes, have no fear at all. I'll answer for it and take the sin upon me. Yeah. Your cough is very bad. Yes, 
I'm in torture. Uh, well, would you accept this bit of licorice? The case is, is obstinate, I find, and all the licorice in the world will do no good. Oh, this is very trying. Oh, more than my words can say. In any case, your scruples easily removed. With me, you're sure of secrecy then, and there's no harm unless a thing is known. The public scandal is what brings offence. The secret sinning is not a sin at all. <laughs> <laughs> so then I see I must resolve to yield. I must consent to you to grant you everything and cannot hope to give full satisfaction or win full confidence at lesser cost. No doubt tis very hard to come to this. Tis quite against my will I go so far, but since I must be forced to it, since nothing that can be said suffices for belief, since more convincing proof is still demanded, I must make up my mind to humor people. If my consent give reason for offense, so much the worse for him who forced me to it. The fault can surely not be counted mine. It need not, <laughs> madam. And the thing itself? Open the door, I pray you, and just see whether my husband's not there in the hall. Why take such care for him? Between ourselves, he is a man to lead round by the nose. He's capable of glorying in our meetings. I told him so he'd see all and deny it. But no matter go, I beg you, look about and carefully examine every corner. Act four, scene six. <laughs> that is, I own, a, a man abominable. I can't get over it. The whole thing floors me. What? You come out so soon? <laughs> you cannot mean it. What? Get back under the table. Tis not your <sighs> time. Wait till the end and see and make quite certain and don't believe a thing on mere conjecture. Nothing more wicked Air came out of hell. Oh, dear me. Don't go and quench things too lightly. No, you let yourself be thoroughly convinced. Don't yield too soon, for fear you'll be mistaken. <laughs> Act four, scene seven. All things conspire toward my satisfaction. Madam, I've searched the whole apartment through. There's no one here. And now my ravished soul. Softly. You are too eager in your amours. You needn't be so passionate. Ha <laughs> ha My holy man! You want to put it on me? How is your soul abandoned to temptation? Marry my daughter? <laughs> and what, my wife too? I doubted long enough if this was earnest, expecting all the time the tone would change. But now the proof's been carried far enough. I'm satisfied and ask no more for my part. "'Twas quite against my character to play this part, "'but I was forced to treat you so." "'What? You believe this part?' "'Oh, come now! No protestations. "'Get out from here and make no fuss about it.' "'But my intent—' "'That talk is out of season. "'You leave my house this instant.' "'Oh, you're the one to leave it. "'You <laughs> play the master here.' This house belongs to me, I'll have you know, and show you plainly it's no use to turn these low tricks to pick a quarrel with me, and that you can't insult me at your pleasure, for I have wherewith to confound your lies, avenge offended heaven, and compel those to repent who talk to me of leaving. Act 4, Scene 8. What sort of speech is this? What can it mean? Well, if my faith, I'm dazed. This is no laughing matter. What? Well, from his words, I see my great mistake. The deed of gift is one thing troubles me. The deed of gift? Uh, yes, that is past recall. But I've another thing to make me no anxious. What's that? Oh, you shall know all. Let's see at once whether a certain box is still upstairs. Act five, scene one. Whither away so fast? How should I know? 
methinks we should begin by taking counsel to see what can be done to make the case. Oh, I'm all worked up about that wretched box. More than all else, it drives me to despair. That box must hide some mighty mystery. Argas, my friend, who is in trouble, brought it himself most secretly and left it with me. He chose me in his exile for this trust. And on these documents, from what he said, I judge his life and property depend. How could you tr trust them to another's hands? Oh, by reason of a conscious scruple, I went straight to my traitor to confide in him. His sophistry made me believe that I must give the box to him to keep. So that, in case of search, I might deny my having it at all. And still, by favour of this evasion, keep my conscience clear, even in taking oath against the truth. Your case is bad, so far as I can uh. see. This deed of gift, this trusting of the secret to him, were both, to state my frank opinion, steps that you took too lightly. He can lead you to any length. With these for hostages, and since he holds you at such a disadvantage, you are more imprudent to provoke him. So you must go some gentler way about. What? Can a soul so base, a heart so false, hide neath a semblance of such touching fervor? I took him in. A, a vagabond, a, a beggar. Oh, it is too much. No more pious folk for me. I shall abhor them utterly forever and henceforth treat them worse than any devil. So, there you go again, quite off the handle. In the nothing do you keep an even temper. You <sighs> never know what reason is, but always jump first to one extreme and then the other. You see your error, and you recognize that you've been cozened by a feigned zeal. But to make up for it, in the name of reason, why should you plunge into a worse mistake and find no difference in character? between a worthless scamp and all good people. What? Just because a rascal boldly duped you with a pompous show of false austerity, must you needs have it everybody's like him and no one's truly pious nowadays? Leave such conclusions to mere infidels. Distinguish virtue from its counterfeit. Don't give esteem too quickly at a venture, but try to keep in this the golden mean. You can help it. Don't uphold imposture, but do not rail at true devoutness either. And if you must fall into one extreme, then rather err again the other way. Act five, scene two. What? Father, can the scoundrel threaten you? Forget the many benefits received, and in his base abominable pride, make of your very favors arms against you? Too true, my son. It tortures me to think on't. Let me alone. I'll chop his ears off for him. We must deal roundly with his insolence. Tis I must free you from him at a blow. Tis I, to set things right, must strike him down. Spoke like a true young man. Now just calm down and moderate your towering tantrum, will you? We live in such an age with such a king that violence cannot advance our cause. Act five, scene three. What's this I hear of fearful mysteries? Strange things indeed for my own eyes to witness. Look, you see who I'm requited for my kindness? I zealously receive a wretched beggar. I, I lodge him. Entertain him like my brother, load him with benefactions every day, give him my daughter, give him all my fortune. And he, meanwhile, the villain, rascal, wretch, tries with black treason to suborn my wife. And not content with such a foul design, he dares to menace me with my own favours and would make use of those advantages which my too foolish kindness armed him with to ruin me to take my fortune from me and leave me in a state I saved him from. Poor man. Oh, my son, I cannot possibly believe you could intend so black a deed. What? Worthy men are still the sport of envy. Mother, what do you mean by such a speech? There are strange going-ons about your house and everybody knows 
Your people hate him. What's that to do with what I tell you now? I always said, my son, when you were little, that virtue here below is hated ever. The envious may die, but envy never. Well, that's fine. What's that fine speech to do with present facts? Be sure they forged a hundred silly lies. I've told you once, I saw it all myself. Oh, for slander is abounding, calumnies. Oh, mother, you'd make me damn my soul. I tell you, I saw with my own eyes his shamelessness. Oh, their tongues for spitting venom never lack. There's nothing here below they'll not attack. Your speech has not a single grain of sense. I saw it, Harky, saw it with these eyes. I saw, do you know what saw means? Must I say it a hundred times and din it in your ears? Oh, my dear, appearances are off deceiving and seeing should always be living. Oh, I'll go mad. Oh, false suspicions may delude and good to even oft is misconstrued. Must I construe as Christian charity the wish to kiss my wife? Oh, you must at least have just foundation for accusing people and wait until you see a thing for sure. Oh, the devil! How could I see any surer? Should I have waited till before my eyes he... Oh, no! Don't make me say things quite improper. Oh, in short, tis known to pure a deal in flames and... And so I cannot possibly conceive that you should try to do what's charged against him. If you were not my mother, I should say such things. Oh, I know not what. I'm so enraged. Fortune has paid you fair to be so doubted. You flouted a report. Now yours is flouted. We're wasting time here in the merest trifling, which we should rather use in taking measures to guard ourselves against the scoundrel's threats. You think his impudence could go far? For one, I can't believe it possible. Why, his ingratitude would be too patent. Don't trust to that. He'll find abundant warrant to give good color to his acts against you. And for less cause than this, a strong cabal can make one's life a labyrinth of troubles. I tell you once again, armed as he is, you should you never should have pushed him quite so far. Mm, true. Yet, yet what could I do? The rascal's pride made me lose all control of my resentment. I wish with all my heart that some pretense of peace could be patched up between you two. If I had known what weapons he was armed with, I, I never should have raised such an alarm. And my... Who's coming now? Oh, go quick. Find out. I'm in a fine state to receive a visit. Act five, scene four. Good day, good sister. Pray you let me see the master of the house. He's occupied. I think he can see nobody at present. I'm not by way of being unwelcome here. My coming can, I think, nowise displease him. My errand will be found to his advantage. Your name, then? Tell him simply that his friend, Monsieur Tartuffe, has sent me for his goods. It is a man who comes with civil manners, sent by Tartuffe, he says, upon an errand that you'll be pleased with. Surely you must see him. Find out who he is and what he wants. Perhaps he's come to make it up between us. How shall I treat him? You must not get angry, and if he talks of reconciliation, accept it. Fair good day, and heaven send harm to your enemies, favour to you. This mild beginning suits with my conjectures and promises some compromise already. All of your house has long been dear to me. I had the honour, sir, to serve your father. Oh, sir, I am much ashamed, and ask your pardon for not recalling now your face or name. My name is Loyal. I'm from Normandy. My office is called Bailiff, in despite of envy, and for forty years, th thank heaven, it's been my fortune to perform that office with honour. So I've come by your leave to render service of a certain writ. What? Are you here to... 
Pray, sir, don't be angry. Tis nothing, sir, but just a little summons. Order to vacate you and yours this house. Move out your furniture, make room for others, and that without delay or putting off as needs must be. Well, I leave this house? Yes, please, sir. The house is now, as you will know, of course, Monsieur Tartuffus. And he, beyond dispute of all your goods, is henceforth lord and master, by virtue of a contract here attached. Wrong you form and unassailable. Your insolence is monstrous and astounding. I have no business, sir, that touches you. This is the gentleman. He's fair and courteous and knows too well a gentleman's behavior to wish in any wise to question justice. But do you... Sir, I know you would not for a million wish to rebel. Like a good citizen, you'll, you'll let me put in force the court's decree. Your long black gown may be well. Before you know it, Mr. Court Bailiff, get a thorough beating. Sir, make your son be silent or withdraw. I should be loath to have to set things down and see your names inscribed in my report. This Mr. Loyal looks most disloyal. I have much feeling for respectable and honest folk like you, sir, and consent to serve these papers only to oblige you and thus prevent the choice of any other who, less possessed of zeal for you than I am, might order matters in less gentle fashion. And how could one do worse than order people out of their house? Mr. Loyal. You lost your audio. Just for form's sake, please, you'll bring your keys to me before retiring. I will take care not to disturb your rest and see there's no unseemly conduct here. But by tomorrow and at early morning, you must make haste to move your least belongings. My men will help you. I have chosen strong ones to serve you, sir, in clearing out the house. No one could act more generously, I fancy. And since I'm treating you with great indulgence, I beg you'll do as well as me, and see I'm not disturbed in my discharge of duty. I'd give this very minute and not grudge it the hundred best gold louis I have left if I could just indulge myself and, and land my fist for one good square one on his snout. Careful, don't make things worse. Such insolence. I can hardly restrain myself. My hands are itching to be at him. By my faith, with such a fine broad back, good Mr. Loyal, a little beating would become you well. My girl, such infamous words are actionable, and warrants can be issued against women. Enough of this discussion, sir. Have done. Give us the paper, then leave us pray. Give us the then, au revoir. Heaven keep you from disaster. May heaven confound you both, you and oh. your master. Act five, scene five. Well, mother, am I right or am I not? This writ may help you now to judge the matter, or don't you see his treason even yet? Amazed, befuddled, and beflustered. <sighs> you are quite wrong. You have no right to blame him. This action only proves his good intentions. Love for his neighbor makes his virtue perfect. And knowing money is a root of evil, in Christian charity he'd take away whatever things may hinder your salvation. Oh, be still. You always need to have that told you. Come, let us see what course you are to follow. Ah, uh, go and expose his bold ingratitude. Such action must be it must invalidate the contract. His perfidy must now appear too black to bring him the, the, the success he expects. At five, scene six. Madam, uh, well, well, it is with great danger, sir, that I bring bad news, but urgent danger forces me to do so. 
A close and intimate friend of mine who knows the interest I take in what concerns you has gone so far for my sake as to break the secrecy that's due to state affairs and sent me word, but now that leaves you only the one expedient of sudden flight. <gasps> the villain who so long imposed upon you found means an hour ago to see the prince and to accuse you, among other things, uh, by putting in his hands the private strong box of a state criminal, whose guilty secret you, in failing in your duty as a subject, he says, have kept. I know no more of it, save that a warrant's drawn against you, sir, and for the greatest surety, the same rascal comes with the officer who must arrest you. His rights are armed, and this is how the scoundrel seeks to secure the property he claims. Man is a wicked animal. I'll own it. With the least delay may still be fatal, sir. I have my carriage and a thousand louis provided for your journey at the door. Let's lose no time. The bolt is swift to strike, and such as only flight can save you from. I'll be your guide to seek a place of safety and stay with you until you reach it, sir. How much I owe to your obliging care. Another time I must serve to, must serve to thank you fitly. And I pray heaven to grant me so much favor that I may someday recompense your service. Goodbye. See to it, all of you. Come, hurry. We'll see to everything that's needful, brother. Act five, scene seven. Uh, softly, sir, softly. Do not run so fast. You haven't far to go to find your lodge lodging. By order of the prince, we here arrest you. Traitor! You saved this worst stroke for the last. This crowns your perfidies and ruins me. I shall not be embittered by your insults, for heaven hath taught me to endure all things. <laughs> your moderation, I must own, is great. How shamelessly the wretch makes bold with heaven! Your ravings cannot move me. All my thought is but to do my duty. You must claim great glory from this honorable act. The act cannot be aught but honorable, coming from that high power which sends me here. Ungrateful wretch! Do you forget t'was I that rescued you from utter misery? I have not forgot some help you may have given, uh, but my first duty now is towards my prince. The higher power of that most sacred claim must stifle in my heart all gratitude. And to such puissant ties, I'd sacrifice my friend, my wife, my kindred, and myself. A hypocrite. How well he knows the trick of cloaking him with what we most revere. But if the motive that you make parade of is perfect, as you say, why should it wait to show itself until the day he caught you soliciting his wife? How happens it that you have not thought to go and form against him until his honor forces him to drive you out of the house? And though I need not mention that he's just given you his whole estate, still, if you meant to treat him now as guilty, how could you then consent to take his gift? Pray, sir, I deliver me from all this clamour. Be good enough to carry out your order. Yes, I've too long delayed its execution. It is very fitting you should urge me to it. So, therefore, you must follow me at once to prison, where you'll find your lodging ready. Who? I, sir? You. <laughs> Hey, to prison? You are not the one to whom I owe account. You, sir, recover from your heart alarm. Our prince is not a friend to double dealing. His eyes can meet men's inmost hearts, and all the art of hypocrites cannot deceive him. His sharp discernment sees things clear and true. His mind cannot too easily be swayed, for reason always holds the balance even. He honors and exalts true piety, but knows the false and views it with disgust. This fellow was by no means apt to fool him. Far subtler snares have failed against his wisdom. 
and his quick insight pierced immediately the hidden baseness of this tortuous heart, accusing you the knave betrayed himself, and by true recompense of heaven's justice, he stood revealed before our monarch's eyes a scoundrel, known before by other names, whose horrid crimes detailed at length might fill a long-drawn history of many volumes. Our monarch, to resolve you in a word, detesting his ingratitude and beastness, added this horror to his other crimes, and sent me hither under his direction to see his insolence out top itself, and force you then, force him then to give you satisfaction. Your papers, which the traitor says are his, I am to take from him and give you back. The deed of gift transferring your estate, our monarch's sovereign will, sovereign will makes null and void. And for the secret personal offense your friend involved you in, he pardons you. Thus he was rewards your recent zeal displayed in helping to maintain his rights and shows how well his heart, when it is least expected, knows how to recompense a noble deed and will not let true merit miss its due, remembering always rather good than evil. Now heaven be praised. Oh, at last I breathe again. <laughs> a, a happy outcome. Who'd have dared to hope it? There, traitor, now your brother, hold, and don't descend to such indignities, I beg you. Leave the poor wretch to his unhappy fate, and let remorse oppress him, but not you. Hope rather that his heart may now return to virtue, hate his vice, reform his ways, and win the pardon of our glorious prince. While you must straightway go, and on your knees repay with thanks, his noble, gen generous kindness. Well said. We'll go and at his feet kneel down with joy to thank him for his goodness shown. And this first duty done with honours due, we'll then attend upon another too. With wedded happiness reward Valere and crown a lover, noble and sincere. Yay. Aye. And we'll take all, everyone takes a curtain call. So first we have Monsieur Loyal and police officer Ken Wayne. I'm going to take a bow. Uh, I'm trying to get back to you. Um. There you go. Good. We have Marianne, Amelia Bell, Alaire, Alexis Shilton, Amis, Miguel Fana. Derek Tarson, Madame Pernel, Jackie Margolis, <laughs> Almira Marin Sugarman, hey. Oregon Angus Hepburn, Corinne played Simone Cunard, yay, and our names. Tartuffe, played by Stephen Brown. Bravo! Bravo! Oh, you're an evil villain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well done, everyone. Well done. Lovely. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really fun. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. Thanks. Great thank you. Yes, thank you, Simone. <laughs> thank you. I'll have to ask Paul, uh, maybe we can do a second Moliere. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Oh, uh, we should do his one act. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one act. <laughs> oh, oh, the oh, incident of Versailles oh, is brilliant. The imaginary invalid has a lot of mise en scene. Is that how you yeah. say it? Yeah, yeah, good one. But there are also a couple of shorter ones, like uh, the school for the school for husbands, uh -huh. which is a short one, and also there's the bungler. A couple of ones. Two precious, two precious maidens oh. ridiculed. <laughs> mm. But they uh, are saying the the incident at Versailles is wonderful because he's not only poking fun at himself, he's poking fun at all the members of his company in it. Uh, and there's all sorts of plays on things in that. It's difficult to find and there isn't really a, a desperately good translation of it, but it, it's a joy. I mean, it really is. I'd love and of course, the... 
Scopan would be one of mine. Like if we could, yeah. yeah, that's that's the first one I ever saw. The first Molière I ever saw. Ah, yeah, I oh, did um, the Bourgeois Gentleman uh, with the Cocteau in New York, and I did about <laughs> yeah. Uh, about a week and a half into rehearsal, I turned around and suddenly realized that I had played the same role um, in Edinburgh when I was younger, because I, I didn't play young characters, I always played the older characters. And I suddenly realized that the last time I had done that play and doing that role was before most of the cast were even born, <laughs> which was really quite scary. It's funny it's going back to a role you've done before. It's, it's oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I was uh, um, the first movie very I long time ago. Capino with Jim Dale. Oh, cool. I was in a uh, at a summer regional theater up in Albany, and one of our shows was a thing called Moliere's Shorts, which was um, which was his like three of his one act plays yeah. to, with music. And it was a musical comedy and it was quite, we had a great, wonderful backdrop of a pair of boxers with Moliere written across the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, all, we all entered and exited through the crotch in the middle, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good opening for Liz Estrada. <laughs> <laughs> we did the imaginary invalid as a production with the mitantine and we had somebody who played the piano and we all had songs in it. We had a choreographer who had been working on Broadway and she had us do all kinds of movements to it. It was interesting. It was really, really interesting. <laughs> yeah. I was not a soprano, I'm an alto. And the piano player, she was a soprano. She kept having me high keys. It was like really, really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard. But we did it. We got through it and we did it. It was really well, this, cool. this was the highlight of my Saturday. So thank you guys. This was so much fun. <laughs> thank you, Dana. Hey, Miguel. It was yeah. great. Great. Until next time. Cheers. Yep. Cheers. Take Cheers. care. Cheers. Stay safe. Yeah. You too. Uh, Before I did this tonight, I was back. I uh, was round at one of the local vaccine centers getting my first jab. So I've got my first protection jab. Are you, 